about five years ago, Entrepreneur Magazine put out an article titled Five Kinds of Lazy Employees and How to Handle Them. And I like the titles they give to these five categories. The first title they labeled was The Vanisher. The Vanisher seems to go invisible at odd times without explanation. It could be a two-hour lunch or mysteriously lengthy breaks. Perhaps the person simply calls in sick on a day when a big project is due or shows up late for work on the day of an important meeting. Whatever their behavior, a vanisher always lets you down and forces other team members to pick up the slack. The second kind is the victim. The victim is the work equivalent of the stu student who claims the dog ate my homework in school. There are hundreds of excuses for workers to call in late, and the victim knows them all. From flat tires on the way to work to sick pets or children, the victim is often not afraid to make things up to get out of work responsibilities. The third is called the procrastinator. Everyone is guilty of procrastinating from time to time, they say, but the procrastinator turns it into an art. If you have a major project, the person waits until the last minute to do his part of the work, leaving everyone else involved frustrated and anxious. On a daily operations basis, the procrastinator simply pushes off work to another day while he or she wastes time on non-essential tasks. The third one is called the delegator. The delegator is an interesting type of lazy person, they say, primarily because he or she puts so much effort into avoiding work. Without even being a, in a supervisory position, the delegator constantly pushes work off on everyone else, especially if he or she eventually begins pushing work off on clients or customers. Lastly is the troublemaker, they say. Perhaps the most dangerous lazy worker is the troublemaker, who not only doesn't work, but spends time stirring up drama in the office. The troublemaker can often be seen wandering from desk to desk, gossiping about coworkers and engaging in casual chit chat. If they don't feel confident engaging, uh, if they don't feel confident engaging others in conversations, they may instead conduct the same kind of drama mongering through email or online. The troublemaker zaps the productivity of other workers in the office and even puts your business at risk of having confidential information exposed, they say. Now most of us maybe have had some of those tendencies in our lives if we're honest. I saw one person pointing to themselves as I read one category. We won't point out who that person was. But most of us at some point in our lives, maybe when we were younger, starting to learn how to work and what expectations were, or maybe older as we started to not care quite as much about our position, we probably could identify with one of those categories to some extent. And the truth is that most of us have room to improve as people that work for other people. We have room to improve as employees that work somewhere for someone in some capacity. Maybe it's a part-time job we have as a young person as we're getting started or still in school. Maybe it's a full-time career that we have as adults. Maybe it's helping with nonprofits or ministries while we're working at home raising kids. Or maybe it's a simple part-time job we have as we approach our later years. It's inevitable that we all are gonna work for other people, whether officially for a paycheck or unofficially when we're helping out friends or family with different events. And we're gonna talk about work today. The title of our message is Work Doing Secular Work in a Sacred Way. And what we're going to learn from Paul in this passage in Colossians is that obedience is the correct response to God and to our superiors, even when it's difficult, even when no one is watching, because we will be rewarded or punished by God for how we do our work. So we're going to be in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, and as we kind of parachute into this book, Today, I want to share with you a little bit about the city of Colossae. 
Paul wrote this letter to the believers living in the city of Colossae. It was located about 100 miles east of the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor, which is now known as modern Turkey. And it was a unique city that ended up being destroyed by an earthquake in 64 AD. It was slightly rebuilt, but then abandoned in the 8th century, and no one's ever excavated the city. So we don't know much about what it was like to live there. But we do know a little bit about how they became a group of Christian believers. The Apostle Paul was in the city of Ephesus sharing the Bible, and this guy named Epaphras, who lived in Colossae, went over to Ephesus, became a Christian under Paul's ministry, and then he went back to Colossae and shared the gospel with them and started the church there. But several years go along, and some people start to have confusion about doctrine, and so that same guy, Epaphras, goes to Paul in Rome with some questions and some concerns about his friends and the church in Colossae. Paul had been spending a, a period of time in Rome under house arrest, and so Paul ends up writing this letter that he sends back to the believers in Colossae that a guy named Tychicus carries back to them. Colossians is one of four letters that Paul wrote from prison. Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And in that letter, we don't really know the exact doctrine that was being uh, struggled with or what the issues were, but we do know from Paul's letter a few things that might have been problem areas that he addresses. One was the identity of Christ described in chapter 1. Another one was some of the Jewish legalism around Jewish holidays and things like that in chapter 2 and some other basic behavioral issues that are described in chapter 3. So in this letter, and specifically in chapter 3, we're going to look at what Paul says about work, how he describes the members of service that there are, these two different groups or members of service, the manner of service, and lastly, the motive that we should have for service. Now let's start by looking at these members of service that he describes. There in chapter 3, verse 22, he says, Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. Now slaves indicates one that sells himself into slavery for another person. And slavery is something that was common in the new century, first century time, so it's good we understand a little bit about the culture of the first century in which Paul is writing for us here. Prostitution was very common in that time. Homosexuality was common. Even some of the Roman emperors are known to be homosexuals. Marital infidelity was regular. Divorce was easily occurring, and they even knew how to uh, perform abortions in the first century Roman culture. And slavery was part of that larger culture in which they lived. At this time, most people estimate but that between 17 to 33 percent of the population in the Roman Empire were slaves, which means about one out of every five or one out of every three people were slaves. Slaves most commonly were acquired through warfare. When Rome would conquer a new nation or a new area, they would take a portion of those people to Italy to be their slaves. But slavery for them looked a lot different than we think about slavery as Americans today. Slaves often lived within the home of their masters. They didn't have a little hut or a tent or any bad living conditions. They often lived within the house of the person that they worked for. And slavery was not based on race. For us as Americans, we kind of equate slavery with racism, but back then it wasn't connected to race. It was more based on economic status. And slaves at that time often performed jobs or tasks right alongside free men and free women. We have documents that describe how slaves were often educated for their jobs in the first century. Slaves, we know, were physicians, architects, craftspeople, shopkeepers, cooks, barbers, artists, professional poets, 
teachers, and even philosophers were all known to be positions that sometimes slaves held. And I'm sharing some of this with you because if you're like me, sometimes as you talk to people, they ask you questions. Why didn't Paul or Jesus fix slavery in their times? Why did the Bible allow for slavery continue to continue? And there's a couple of reasons for that as we read Paul's words here. One, Paul was not trying to reconstruct an entire society. Paul was always trying to share the gospel with people. He wasn't trying to reconstruct the Roman Empire. He was trying to share the gospel with people. Secondly, Paul wasn't trying to attract people to Christianity for the wrong reasons. He wanted people to have a sincere faith in Jesus Christ. If he would have said slavery was wrong and you should all become free and leave your masters, he would have had a pretty big crowd all of a sudden, but they wouldn't have been authentic followers of Jesus. And third, Paul in his letters does not endorse terrible living conditions for slaves. In 1 Corinthians, he says it's best for a slave not to become a slave if possible. In another place, he says a slave should try to become free if possible. And in his letter to Timothy, he condemns slave traders and slave kidnappers and people that would have participated in slave um, trafficking, kind of like we understand human trafficking today. See, Paul was focused on people coming to faith in Christ, not on fixing the cultural problem of the Roman Empire. Paul was not concerned about changing the culture. He was trying to change, transform the church that people were part of. So those first members of service that Paul describes are slaves. And the second members of service in this paragraph are masters in verse 1 of chapter 4. He writes, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. We learn from Paul here that a master's place or his position does not make him exempt from needing to obey God and still act fairly and justly. For a slave owner to avoid judgment, he or she would need to embrace fairness. That slave owner might be a master on earth, but Paul is telling them there is a master in heaven that they are supposed to be obeying as well. In a way, slave owners and Christian employers or bosses or supervisors are slaves too bound to obey Christ. And what we learn here in these two groups that he describes is that both the powerful and poor are expected to obey God because the Lord is Lord over them all. Slave or free, we are going to answer to God for our actions. Poor or rich, we are going to face God and be rewarded or punished. Influential or insignificant, we are going to report to God for what we've done. And for us in modern Western cultures, Paul's words here about slaves and masters can be applied to employees and employers. And that's where I'd like to take us next. There are some differences, of course, but I think the principles transfer. And he talks about the manner of service in chapter 3, verse 22, kind of starting right there after the word slaves. He says, slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. So here at the beginning of verse 22, we see this command that's pretty basic. Slaves in all things, right, describing all the obligations we're under, all things, obey those who are your masters on earth. The word for obey there is the Greek word hupakauo, which means to follow instructions. It's often translated as obey, follow, or be subject to, 
Sometimes you go to seminary and you spend lots of time and lots of money to learn Greek and Hebrew so you can learn, look these words up, and then you look it up and you're like, well, obey means obey. <laughs> There's not much else there, but it means just to do what you're told. And that's what he's telling these workers. That's the command. In all things to obey their masters. But then he gives a couple of characteristics of that command. And the first characteristic is that it's not supposed to be something merely focused on pleasing men. In verse 22, he says, those who merely please men. He says, not with external service as those who merely please men. Now, why is their work not supposed to just be focused on pleasing men? Tony Evans says, you live before a sovereign God who sees everything you do. His rewards for your faithfulness are better than any raise you can receive. And pay attention to the beginning of verse 23 there. He says, whatever you do. This is addressed to all people everywhere. Janitors, managers, lunch workers, accountants, police officers, whatever you do, this is all groups of workers. These are commands for all people to obey everywhere. There might be different jobs with different skill sets. There might be jobs within the church or outside the church, but all people are supposed to obey those they're subject to. And the second characteristic of this command is that it's supposed to be pleasing to God. At the end of verse 22 and into 23, he lists three ways that our work is supposed to please God. One with sincerity of heart, he says, nearing the end of verse 23. There's a natural tendency for us to want to work a little bit harder when our boss is watching, right? If he's not around or she's not around, we can slack off a little bit. But Paul says here, with sincerity of heart, do the same work just as hard whether your earthly master is watching or gone. The first full-time job I had was at 21 years of age. I worked in an office at the United Way of Stanislaus County. And as the youngest and the newest employee, they gave me a little cubicle right in the middle of the office with my back facing the front door where everybody walked right past me. And it was a great way to make sure I was always working while I was at work. I couldn't do anything on the computer or at my desk without someone walking by and seeing that I was goofing off or anything. It was a great lesson or a great uh, training method for a young, immature person to have to be accountable that way. I had to work when I was there, not just when my boss was watching. And the second way that we please God with our work is that we fear him. At the end of verse 22, we do our work fearing the Lord, it says. We work with an awareness of God watching us at all times. And third, our work is pleasing to God when we do our work heartily, it says in verse 23. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord. A literal way to translate that is that we work from the soul. We work from the core of one's being. Our work should be genuine with love for God and for his people. In Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus told the disciples, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. Paul said something similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. He said, whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Our work should be genuine and from within whatever it is we find ourselves doing. See, what Paul is describing here in this manner of service is that we do our work as instructed with diligence even when we're not being watched by our earthly boss because we are always being watched by our heavenly boss. Harry Ironside tells a story 
Uh, he grew up in the early 1900s where you would make shoes in each local city, right? Usually there was a shoemaker as part of a lot of towns, and that was his job as a young man to make shoes. And so he would take the cowhide and he'd get it wet and then cut it and then beat out the extra water and then he'd nail it onto a shoe and he'd let it dry and then they'd provide the shoe. But he sometimes would go and watch another shoemaker that he didn't work for just to learn as a young person. And he noticed this shoemaker would just take the water, take the cowhide right out of the water, put it right on the shoe, and give it to people. He wouldn't pound out the water or let it dry or cure or anything. And Harry asked the shoemaker, he said, are shoes made better when you do it that way? And the shoemaker smiled, a little cynical smile, and replied with a wink, no, but they come back much quicker this way. They wear out faster. So Harry, as a young man, think that might be a lucrative idea. So he went back to his boss and he said, I learned this way, you know, we can save a little time and the shoes will come back faster and we'll make a little more money. And Harry says that his boss pulled out his Bible, read to him Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than from men. And his boss said, Harry, I don't make shoes just for money. I'm doing it for the glory of God. If at the judgment seat of Christ, I should have to view every shoe I ever made, I don't want to hear the Lord say, Dan, that was a poor job. You didn't do your best. I want to hear God smile and say, well done, good and faithful servant. See, as believers that work for someone else, we don't keep an eye on the clock or we don't keep an eye on our boss. We keep an eye on God to make sure we are pleasing him with everything that we do. It means we shouldn't be playing video games on our cell phones when we're supposed to be working. It means we shouldn't be on Amazon ordering things for our personal life when we're supposed to be working. It doesn't mean we should be taking toilet paper or anything else home for our own personal benefits. We work as instructed with diligence for God. So Paul describes the manner of this behavior, how we're supposed to act in verses 22 and 23. And then he gives the motive for this service. And he gives three reasons, three motivations for serving a boss in this way. The first one is in verse 24. And it's spiritual rewards where it says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. We obey the Lord and the Lord gives us an inheritance. There's a reward that we'll get in heaven and probably one of those rewards is some type of an inheritance. And in believer, as believers, we should not have to be motivated by our master or our boss with a carrot or a stick or anything like that. We should always be working hard because of those rewards we know we'll get in heaven because of our hard work. And as believers, this should be encouraging for us because sometimes we work for places that don't always reward our hard work or give us good benefits because of the good things we've done. But we can take comfort in the fact that when we work hard for God, there will always be rewards in heaven for us. So that's the first motive for service, our spiritual rewards. The second is the sovereignty of the Lord. There in the middle of verse 24, it says, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. See, God's placed us where we are for a reason, and we serve him there because he's God. Paul calls Jesus here Lord Christ, which is a unique way that he talks about Jesus, not in many other places. Christ refers to Jesus' work as the coming Messiah, and Lord refers to Jesus' sovereignty over the whole world. These words together reminded the Colossians to be conscious of their salvation, which came from the same person that was their master. Their salvation and their master was the same person. And if he cared enough to save their soul, he cared enough to serve their needs wherever they were. So there's spiritual rewards. There's the sovereignty of the Lord. And third reason for motive for service is spiritual punishment in verse 25. 
For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Now, not much is revealed here about this spiritual punishment, but we know at the least it's a lack of reward, but at the most it is some type of a punishment. Furthermore, there are no excuses allowed. There are no second chances. It doesn't matter our circumstances. We are expected to have obedience to God. And there will be consequences for our disobedience. Now, God does forgive sins and he removes guilt, but often there are still consequences for those actions. And here in verse 25, as he's talking about spiritual punishment, most commentators say the way this is framed and how it maybe even appears in your Bible, it's in the same paragraph as with slaves and masters there. Chapter 4, verse 1 is probably in the same paragraph as the beginning part with slaves. Paul is almost kind of touching both slaves and masters with this description of punishment. That is, slaves will be punished if they don't obey. Masters will also be punished if they don't treat their slaves correctly. See, what we learn here is that we are motivated by a heavenly God, not an earthly person. And we're accountable for our behavior as both workers and employers. Now, God gives us free will to make decisions, and that's a great gift and a great thing we get to enjoy but it's good for us to remember that there are consequences to that free will that we have. And that lands us with the natural question, how do we live out our faith while in the world? How do I live as a saint in a secular world? And I hope you see from Paul's words here And have realized that all work is sacred. All work is done for God. Whether it's a non-profit or a for-profit. Whether it's outside the home at a company or inside the home taking care of a kids and running a household. Whether it's in a church or a business setting. All work is sacred and, and important. And a good example of that is from a guy named Paul Hewson. Paul Hewson grew up in Dublin, Ireland. When he was 14 years old, his dad died unexpectedly. And as they were at the graveside lowering his dad into the earth, his mom collapsed and she died just a few days later in the hospital. And Paul found himself as a 14-year-old orphan without a mom and dad. But his friend named Derek introduced him to Christianity and brought him to church and got him a Bible. And Paul says he couldn't stop reading scripture. He became a Christian and believed in Jesus Christ and dedicated his life to Christ. But Paul also liked music and he liked writing music. And he found himself writing music that was characterized as rock and then they got a contract for a record and then they got signed up to go on tour. But as Paul began touring around promoting his record, him and some of his band members felt like that wasn't really what they're supposed to do. They thought, shouldn't we be sharing the gospel in our town in Dublin, Ireland? Shouldn't we be helping our church with evangelism? So Paul and one of the other band members quit, and they went to go tell their boss, their business manager, Paul McGinnis, about how they thought that they were being led to quit this tour. But their boss said, did you ask God about your contract you signed with us? See, when you wanted that record deal, you signed this contract that you would go on this tour to promote the record and play music. So Paul Houston eventually realized maybe that's what God wants us to do. We need to honor our commitment. We need to do what our boss, our manager is telling us. And so they went back on tour. Now his name was Paul Hewson, his given name, but his nickname was Bono from U2. That's how he started in the music industry. And he's always been a believer his whole life for those 40 years of writing songs and playing music. 
And he learned through that experience that his place was in the world representing God to a non-godly group of people through music, to write songs that talked about God's glory and beauty and to use poetry and things like that. Sadly, he's sometimes been labeled as too Christian for mainstream music, but he's too mainstream for Christian music. And even he tells a story about how in 2003, Billy Graham had learned about U2, and he invited the band to his house in North Carolina because he wanted to give them a blessing, probably wanted to share the gospel with them, right? Zobano says that all his bandmates were supposedly too busy to go see Billy Graham, but he hopped on a plane, he went to North Carolina, and who else is there to pick him up besides Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son? And Bono says as soon as he got in the car, Franklin Graham starts peppering him with questions. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Do you believe in him? And Franklin Graham eventually said, why aren't your songs Christian songs? And Bono said, well, they are Christian songs, but I don't always talk about God and Jesus. God has put me kind of in this tension to be a Christian representing others in a non-godly world. I want to be a Christian believer that also sings in the rock industry. Now, I don't know a lot about Bono, but if he survived a meeting with Billy Graham and still thinks he's a Christian, I'm sure we can be assured that he is a believer. He eventually met with Billy Graham and, and left, of course. But what Bono learned early on in his work in Ireland, that even if he's not labeled as doing, you know, Jesus work, his work should always be giving glory to Jesus. And that should be our goal with our work, to give glory to Jesus in what we do and how we do it. Let's pray. God, thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul that tell us how to live in the culture we're in that sometimes doesn't seem much different than the Roman culture as we look at it and, and learn about it. That there is immorality and, and things that occur in our culture that aren't according to your standards, but you still call us to live in a certain way. And I pray for our church and for myself that you would help us to obey those people we're supposed to be under, to obey the, the employers we're serving, to cooperate with others, whether it's official or unofficial, whatever that might be. Please give us the courage to do that. Be with us as we go about it in our family situations or community places or even a professional job. Help us to serve others and to serve the people you've placed over us like you want it to be. And I pray that we would be able to witness to you in those circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll invite you to stand for the benediction if you are able to. And then we will take about maybe five minutes, ten minutes to gather the food and get it ready. And I hope you can stay with us for some, some potluck time next. Let us go and be light to our community. Just as we have placed our faith in Jesus, our light, let us go and be a light to others so that we may point them to the source of our light, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dismissed.